Alright. Alright. Ready to go here? Good evening, Gus. Good evening, brother. How you doing? Doing all right. Good. So to all of our participants, welcome to a presentation by a friend of Malcolm X. This is hosted by the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation in Omaha, Nebraska. The Malcolm X Memorial Foundation was founded in 1971 by a woman named Rowena Moore. Rowena Moore was born in Meridian, Oklahoma in 1910. So she's older than Malcolm X. At the age of 13, her family moved to Omaha, Nebraska looking for a job. So they ended up in South Omaha. Now Malcolm's family moved here to Omaha as early as we know as 1921. In 1921, Malcolm had an older sister, Hilda, and an older brother born here in Omaha, Nebraska. Malcolm was born himself, Malcolm Little, May 19th, 1925 at University Hospital. Now we don't know if he actually was born in the hospital because at that time, some black families would have their children at home and then they would present the baby for a birth certificate. Now, Malcolm went through the trajectory that we know of throughout his life. He went from foster home to foster home after his father was killed. And if you don't know much about Malcolm, I recommend you definitely go look him up. But I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Rowena Moore. So when Rowena Moore came to Omaha, Nebraska, her family started working in the South Omaha. Now they eventually moved to North Omaha into a home at 3448 Pinckney. Now in approximately 1927 to 1928, the Little family, who was only here for a short period of time, approximately 1921 to 1927, they moved out of Omaha, Nebraska, and they abandoned this small little shack style home. Now Rowena Moore, the founder of the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation here in Omaha, Nebraska, she and her family moved into this house that was once the home that Malcolm X once lived in. Now Rowena Moore didn't know this at the time, she continued on with life. Now, in her 50s or so, she began to do a lot of activist work. Rowena actually sat on 34 boards here in Omaha, Nebraska. She was also a delegate to the Black National Convention that took place in Gary, Indiana in 1972. Rowena Moore was very, very active in her community, and she was very well regarded. Now, in 1971, her sister read the autobiography of Malcolm X after Malcolm was assassinated. Now, Rowena Moore herself had not a lot of knowledge about Malcolm X. In 1965, she knew of him, but she wasn't a big fan, didn't follow him very closely. That same year, 1965, when Malcolm was assassinated, the house was torn down here in Omaha, Nebraska. So we're still trying to find records as the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation to this day of some type of blueprint so that people can actually see what the house once looked like. But in 1971, when Rowena Moore's sister called her, she told her that Malcolm lived in the house that they once lived in. Rowena didn't believe it until she came back to the site at 3448 Pinckney. When she got there, she noticed that it was barren land, but she recognized the neighborhood. And she confirmed with her sister that her sister was right. They did live in the house that Malcolm X once lived in. So Rowena took it upon herself to purchase that property. So she negotiated a deal and she bought the property. But Rowena didn't stop there. As an organizer, Rowena got more property that was next to Malcolm's house. Now in 1925, that home was on farmland. So the city had never developed around the previous birth site of Malcolm X. So Rowena was able to get the land for pretty cheap. And she bought the lot next to Malcolm's home. Then she bought the lot next to Malcolm's previous home. Then she bought the lot next to that and the lot next to that. Rowena Moore died in 1998, but by the time she died, she had purchased 9.28 acres dedicated to the birth of Malcolm X. She incorporated the organization in the mid 1980s as the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation, a nonprofit organization. And through the work of the nonprofit organization, the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation has subsequently purchased 18 plus acres of land dedicated to the birth of Malcolm X here in Omaha, Nebraska. So if you ever get a chance to visit Omaha, Nebraska, come step foot on a place where real organizers and real leaders are born, made, and continue to do great work. So, Without a lot more conversation, I want to welcome my good friend, Mr. Gus Newport, and he can tell you more about his history. Gus has been an awesome mentor, an awesome friend, and he's just invaluable to not only this day and this time, but he's been invaluable to a lot of other cities and a lot of other places. So please sit back and enjoy hearing about a friend of Malcolm X. And if you don't know who I am, I'm Leo, the board president of the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation. 
Good evening, brothers and sisters. I want to thank Leo for inviting me to share with you my history and relationship with Malcolm X. As I think about this discussion, which we are about to embark on, I feel that there has never been a time more relevant than now to discuss Malcolm X and for all to get an understanding of who he was. I grew up in Rochester, New York, a city in upstate New York, which geographically lies between Syracuse and Buffalo, New York. I shall read some of my early remarks as remembering Malcolm is an immense undertaking. Rochester is one of two cities in the United States that had two race riots in the 60s. And as a result of my involvement in the movement, I was selected to direct the biggest civil rights group in the city. Police brutality was rampant, as it is today. In 1961, the Rochester police invaded the Black Muslim mosque, claiming that there was a fire inside and that they had come to assist the fire department. There was no fire and the police hadn't been summoned. And so the members of the mosque formed a ring around the mosque, refusing to let the police enter. Because of this skirmish, the police arrested eight of the Muslim brothers and jailed them. Being Muslims, they didn't eat any pork, so because they didn't trust the police, the brothers only consumed warm milk. As soon as Malcolm got the word, he called Daisy Bates, who was in Rochester organizing for the NAACP. Unlike what was often quoted in the newspaper, Malcolm had a relationship with all the civil rights leaders. Daisy Bates is best remembered for the work that she and her husband did to integrate the schools in Little Rock, Arkansas. Malcolm told Daisy that he would be coming to Rochester to deal with the arrest and who should he be in touch with. Daisy told Malcolm X that Gus Newport was a person and she gave him my phone number. When Malcolm called me, I was taken aback because Daisy hadn't alerted me to the fact that she had given him my number. However, I was so enamored by hearing his voice that after we had introduced ourselves, I listened intensely and responded to any questions which he had. Our phone conversation lasted for two hours and he called me every night for about two weeks and then he came to Rochester. He landed in Rochester on a cold February day and believe me in Rochester, New York, it gets cold. We were on the shores of Lake Ontario right across from Canada and our winters are brutal. In those days, airplanes landed on a tarmac, let the stairs down from the side door of the plane. Passengers departed and walked from the outside into the airport. When Malcolm came through the door as we had never met, he inquired out loud, who is Eugene Newport, as Gus is my nickname? And I raised my hand and said, that I am, sir. Malcolm responded, and this was for everyone present to hear. Young blood, you got the best tap telephone in America. This is all FBI here, as the area was full of white men in suits, hats, and ties. Some passengers in the press sort of jolted and some laughed. We, Malcolm and I walked through the airport together, went to my car, and drove straight to the courthouse. Upon arrival, we went to the county sheriff's office and he met with Malcolm and I for an hour. As court was in session, the sheriff called down and had the eight brothers move to the court for trial and sentencing. While we waited for the judge to take the bench, the sheriff who weighed all the 400 pounds and was sitting on the other side of the aisle from where Malcolm and I were sitting, fell asleep. Malcolm leaned over and hit me on the shoulder to bring my, this to my attention that the sheriff seemed to be unconscious and whispered in my ear, look there, brother, the power of our law seems to have taken that cracker's heart. Within seconds, he woke up and Malcolm said, Allah has given him another chance. Malcolm was always joking to keep the atmosphere light. And so when you really came to know him, he began to recognize what a pleasant and intelligent person he was. Unlike the way that the media portrayed him as violent, mean, and without compassion. 
The trial lasted less than 30 minutes, and the eight brothers were released. We took them to one of the Muslims' home and gave them a warm meal, and then we went to the Baden Street Settlement Center, a community nonprofit where a community meeting was taking place. Malcolm was called on to speak, and naturally the audience was ecstatic. Malcolm gave the history of the white man and totally broke down how we as black people had been and still are treated in this country. He spoke to the divisions between black organizations, black churches, etc. What he hammered home was that we are all black and that we must come together to improve our conditions. We must improve our communities, including our schools, our economies. We men must show great respect for our women and children. We must upgrade the quality of our communities. And he went on and on. He also emphasized the fact that we as African Americans should be striving for human rights, not just civil rights. The audience was charged up, except for the leaders of such organizations as the NAACP and the Urban League. Malcolm kept emphasizing that we are all black and all in the struggle we face together. The very following day, the next day, the New York State Legislature passed the law that Malcolm X would not be government or nonprofit structure in the state of New York. I, I have never in my life to this day seen a legislature move so fast to bar a person from speaking in the public to the public. However, Malcolm returned often and regularly because the Imam of the Buffalo and Rochester Mosque was a good friend of Malcolm. I learned after Malcolm was expelled from the Nation of Islam that Minister Robert J., the Imam of both Rochester and Buffalo, was the brother of one of Malcolm's girlfriends before he married Betty Shabazz. She was on the staff of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and was the one who informed Malcolm that Elijah Muhammad had made several women on his, on his staff pregnant. Within the year after I met Malcolm, and I stayed in touch as he visited Rochester often, I was terminated from my job because of our relationship. I applied for a job at IBM in New York, was hired, and I moved to New York, and then got transferred to White Plains, New York, just 30 minutes north of New York by train. This was a fortunate move, as I got to spend time with Malcolm and some of his closest allies. One of his closest friends was Adam Clayton Powell, minister of Abyssinian Church in Harlem and the congressman of the Har U.S. Congress of the Harlem District. Powell came home every weekend and often joined Malcolm at one of the street corner rallies. The nation had built what appeared, appeared to be a large boxing ring, placed it at the corner of 125th and 7th, and Malcolm and others used to climb into it speak by microphone to the crowds of people. Malcolm was so well respected that the police allowed him. A Adam often joined him and spoke to the crowds also. Adam was forced out of office and we were in the process of getting Malcolm to run for the congressional seat when he was assassinated. I have always questioned why no one who wrote about Malcolm ever published the fact because we had already polled, and it was a slam dunk that Malcolm was going to be our next congressperson. But as I often say, history is not truly recorded in the U.S., only propaganda. In 1963, when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, Malcolm was interviewed and he made the statement that Kennedy's assassination was the chickens coming home to roost. Elijah Muhammad immediately expelled Malcolm from the nation for 90 days. The media hadn't published why Malcolm made the statement. Malcolm said the chickens are coming home to roost because John F. Kennedy getting ready to run for re-election had pulled together the leadership of the Nation of Islam and the Ku Klux Klan. The reason being because each spoke to the fact that they wanted to have a piece of land in the southeastern part of the United States because they believed in separatism and nationalism. 
Malcolm found this out, he was very perturbed because even though I want us blacks to organize, he said, I want us the blacks to organize to create an agenda so that we can come to a common table with white people, work to get things done. And he certainly did not want to be associated or any place with the Ku Klux Klan. Then Malcolm discovered later that he'd been telling a lie. And this lie came to him when Malcolm went to Mecca on the Hajj. And in Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia, one of the holiest cities from the standpoint of Islam, when you go on the Hajj, it's up in the mountains and you stay in a tent. Malcolm's tent partner was a white Muslim. And Elijah Muhammad had always trained them to believe that only blacks could be Muslims. So Malcolm was greatly disturbed that he had been preaching a lie. And actually, when he got back off that Hajj, he went to a psychologist and went to some counseling because he did not ever want to be known for telling a lie. After he found out, after the 90 days, that he was not going to be going back into the Nation of Islam, Malcolm created Muslim Mosque Incorporated, and then he created the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And to my great surprise, he invited me to help organize this with him. Some of the founding members was Hewlin Jack, the first black borough president of Manhattan, Percy Sutton, who was Malcolm's lawyer and owned the Apollo Theater. There were other brothers who had been in the nation and left it. And together, we pulled together this organization. We would meet every Sunday at a hall up in northern Manhattan. Because we understood the threat of Malcolm's life, there were security people at the door that patted down everybody who came in and the hall was always full. Malcolm was always answered by a brother named Brother Benjamin, who was a great friend of mine who used to be at Moss number seven, but he left the nation when Malcolm did. As a matter of fact, there was an attempt that appeared to shoot at Malcolm once when he was giving a talk at, at Moss number seven and Brother Benjamin dove in front of Malcolm. The place was always crowded and Malcolm would give us talk and then entertain questions from people. And it was great for young people to hear this and begin to learn from it. When we created, set up uh, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, Malcolm took an office in the Teresa Hotel at 125th and seven in Manhattan. He, he, he had teachings, classes every Saturday for those of us who were very close to him to train us in what he called street corner speaking. Street corner speaking, I, I used to always say, it was the, 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 the precessor to hip hop. Because if you heard any of Malcolm's records or anything, you know he had a tendency to repeat things. He used to say things like, you got to have a head to move ahead to get ahead, and things like that in his discussions. He made these statements so that it penetrated the mind so that we could all be ready to do things. It was because he had this office at the Teresa Hotel when Fidel Castro came to New York to speak at the United Nations and was refused entry into the hotel that his people had been registered in. Malcolm invited Fidel to come up to the Teresa Hotel. 500,000 black people in Harlem showed up to cheer on Fidel Castro. Fidel had us go out and get live chickens for him so that he could pluck them cook them because he didn't trust anybody else cooking for him. He knew his life was under threat also because of course the US tended to invade Cuba at one time. 
Malcolm just continued to grow and blossom, etc., and whatever else. And after he went on the Hajj, he also traveled to meet heads of African countries and had meetings with Nehru and other such people as that. He also went to England and France. In England, he was accepted. He spoke at a couple of universities. I actually spoke a couple of years ago at one of the universities in London that he spoke at. Then he went to France, but France refused to let Malcolm in. And when he got off in the tar back and they refused entry, Malcolm took his nickel out of his pocket, threw it on the runway and said, this is what the country is worth. But he came back to the country and uh, Juanita Portier, Sidney Portier, the actor's wife, uh, pulled together a meeting with Malcolm, Ozzie Davis and Ruby D, A. Philip Randolph, with four Muslims there, Clarence Jones, who was Martin Luther King's lawyer, was there. And we had Martin Luther King on the phone. Martin was in Florida, again in jail. He'd been arrested for demonstrating. The meeting started off where Juanita, who got to know Malcolm real well, jokingly said, Brother Malcolm, I thought you were, start going, you were going to stop calling white people devils. I said, look at you. You got red hair and green eyes. Because Malcolm's mother had been half white. And uh, he said, yes, I am. But he went back and he told us a story about when he was speaking at Oxford in the United Kingdom. And he was debating the most brilliant scholar at Oxford. And this, 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 this uh, Oxford professor couldn't believe that Malcolm was beating him. So he said, wait a minute, halt. Oh. said, Malcolm, I thought you were going to stop calling white people devils. Malcolm hesitated for about 30 seconds. said, yes, I am, brother, but who's going to replace you? And of course, the audience just cracked up. But you must understand that this meeting at Juanita's house, it had been discussed because Malcolm often went to the United Nations, that he was gonna go before the United Nations and file a complaint against American hegemony, imperialism, and colonialism. And Martin Luther King, who was on the phone long distance, said, and brother, I'll be there with you to second it. We found out later that J. Edgar Hoover had wired that, that call and all calls that came into Malcolm's office and was stated when we got the records from J. Edgar Hoover's wiretap that these are the two most dangerous black men in the world. 35 days later, after this call, Malcolm X was dead. Soon after that, that meeting, Malcolm's house in Queens, New York, was firebombed. Within the night, family was all sleeping. Malcolm heard the explosion. He jumped up, got everybody up, took them outside, got his rifle because he didn't know who was there trying to do it. The fire personnel came and they put out the fire. A week after that, Malcolm called me, said, Brother Eugene, I've been invited to speak in Rochester, New York at Colgate Divinity and at Cornhill Methodist Church. Will you come with me? Without hesitation, I said, yes. So I met Malcolm at LaGuardia Airport. We got on the plane to Rochester, only about a 45 minute ride at most. But during that flight, Malcolm turned to me and he said, brother, my intelligence has given me the information that my life is in jeopardy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk a dead man. He said, but however, Whatever happens to me, I would never change the life I live and all that I gave to my people and whatever. And I just sat there saying, what a man this is. I had called ahead and asked two black policemen who I knew as a youngster in Rochester to meet us at the airport. And when the plane landed, they were standing on the tarmac waiting for us, they escorted us into the airport, 
Then we went to the hotel where Malcolm was going to be staying. A minister named Minister Franklin Florence saw the nature of how Malcolm was feeling. All his clothes mostly had burned, burned up in the fire at his home. So he went out to a clothing store and brought, brought Malcolm two shirts so he could have a fresh shirt to speak in that night. And then Malcolm went to Colgate Divinity first to speak and then to Cornell Methodist Church. Colgate Divinity wanted Malcolm to speak about Islam and make the comparisons between the U.S. nation of Islam and the true Islamic world. And Malcolm gave a most brilliant discussion. Again, because history is not recorded, in all the writings about Malcolm, nobody that I know ever mentioned the fact that Malcolm was put on the International Board of Islam based in Geneva, Switzerland. That's how well he was respected throughout the world by the leadership in Islam. That night after he spoke at Cornhill Church and wooed the crowd, we went back to his hotel. He allowed me to invite about 15 of my close friends in Rochester they come up to his room and we sat up and we talked all night. The following day, we got back on a plane and flew into LaGuardia. And when we landed in LaGuardia, waiting at the gate for us was the New York chief of police and the fire marshal. And they engaged Malcolm and accused him of firebombing his own home. And you know, Malcolm had really cleaned himself up from his thug days, whatever else, after doing time to becoming a Muslim. Didn't drink, didn't cuss or anything. But that particular day, he used some words, brothers and sisters, that you and I ain't ever heard. And when he got through thrashing that chief of police and the fire marshal, they, 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 they tried to clean it up or whatever else, but he, I pardon my French, he kicked their white ass. Betty Shabazz was parked outside with his wife waiting for us. She picked him up and took him to a hotel where uh, Alex Haley was staying. Alex Haley wrote the autobiography of Malcolm X. And they went there for um, Malcolm to talk with him some more about the book. And that was like a Thursday, Friday. And then I went on up to White Plains home. And that Sunday, I did not go to the regular Sunday meeting, the organization of Afro-American Union. I got a call that Sunday afternoon from my cousin saying, Gus, where are you? I said, I'm home, why? She said, it just came over the news that Malcolm X was assassinated. Please stay in. No boy, I said, oh my God. And I got quite a few calls. Yeah. The following morning, my landlady came up and knocked on my door and she said, there's two white men here to see you. I let them in, they were the FBI. And they were asking me, where are my pistols? I said, I ain't got no pistols. I found out they checked my friends in Rochester and all the places for the same thing. We, um, those were terribly dark times. A couple of weeks later, we had a fundraiser at Juanita and Sidney Portier's house. Max Roach played, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie. Jazz played a real role in the civil rights days. And we raised enough money to buy Betty Shabazz a house up in Westchester. I helped move her by car with the kids, move whatever we could before getting in truck. Betty was eight months pregnant. She drove. I sat in the passenger seat with a rifle across uh, legs because Betty was afraid there might be another hit even on her life. We moved to the house, we cut down all the bushes so nobody could hide in it. I and her, her aunt Ruth scraped all the wallpaper off because she didn't like wallpaper and this has some velvet in it and we painted that. And then later I took her to the hospital when she needed when before that she asked me to take her to Count Bases one night to meet Nina Simone. Turned out Nina Simone lived right in her neighborhood. There's a lot of story, but I think uh, 
if you all don't mind, I'll introduce questions that might get to deeper questions that you might have. I just want to say, as I told Leo, I am very grateful that I got to know Malcolm in doing this project. And at the end, I will give people my email and phone number. So if anybody wants to contact me, find out other things. Because I think we're at a, in this pandemic moment, we also see people demonstrating in the streets because of police brutality and continued killings of black people, not only here in the United States, but across the world. And I want to, as a senior, because when I was a young person in the civil rights movement, the elder people gave me all kinds of assistance to keep young people from being thrown under the bus. So with that all in, and give it back to Leo and answer any questions that we can in the time we've got allotted. Thank you very much. I still Thank you, Leo. Gus, thank you very, yes, very much for that presentation. And thank you for sharing that most valuable history. One of the things I can say I took away from that was when you said that Sister Betty feared for her life so much that she cut down the bushes to make sure people couldn't hide in the bushes to try to take her life. It's those little things, those little sentences that people think are not valuable that could actually be the difference between somebody surviving and not surviving the situation. So this is the reason why our elders and the history and the covering of our elders is so valuable. And you are invaluable, Gus. I appreciate you so much. So if anybody has any questions, what we'd like you to do is put your questions in the chat so that we can curate those questions and get those questions answered. Feel free to type those now. You see Carolyn Baker or Carolyn Becker. Are you still in touch with the family? Uh, yes, uh, the, second, the second daughter, Kabila, and uh, one of the twins, Gamala. Uh, Kabila comes out to the West Coast to visit a couple of times a year. She has a very close uh, friend, a young Jewish woman who I think she may have met when she was going to college, but also Kabila moved to France uh, and lived for a while. And, got to spend a lot of time with Nina Simone and Nina Simone's daughter. And, and she had a, a child there. It was Kabila's son who had a lot of problems and supposedly set the fire, which Betty got injured in and then going to the hospital and dying. He later was killed in Mexico. Gamala remembers me, the twins I, that Betty had when I took her to the hospital. She going to the hospital, me coming to the hospital to visit her when she was very young and bringing her and her sister a doll. And, and about five years ago, we celebrated Malcolm X Day uptown Harlem, and they blocked off nine square blocks, put electric wires up so you could have people could hear for seven blocks away, had music, other people. All the girls were there and I was invited up on stage with the family. But as I was coming up, I mean, I'm now 85 and I walk with a cane sometimes. Block, I hadn't seen Gamala and I don't know when. She saw me approaching the backstage and she said, it's him, it's him. How she could have recognized me after all these years. She just came up and hugged me. And she calls every once in a while. So I do stay in touch. Those two daughters, yes. So another question we have, Gus, is what do you think we can do this moment during this time that will be most influential and make change? I think we got to continue marching and keep the pressure on. We want to make sure we keep it nonviolent. And I say that. And I had to be trained in nonviolence in the, in, 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 in the movement when I was younger although it took me a long time to believe in it because it's very difficult under these circumstances, the way we've been treated. I mean, certain things are breaking through now, like that cop that killed the brother in Atlanta, 
was charged with 11 counts today, including that he might get the death penalty. But I want young people to call on us elders, to share with them our experiences, to share with you also the mistakes that we made, and to assist you in any kind of analysis that you need. Because I remember what all the older people did to keep us from being thrown under the bus in my day. And there's a, there's a worldwide march going on right now. Don't ever feel wrong for what you're doing. But anytime you need help or assistance, call me, Brother Leo, whomever, and we're there for you, whatever it might be. When this pandemic moment is lifted, if it's something you're gonna have in your area, and we can travel there, I'll do that too. Because as my granddaughter says, I'm four years old in baseball, but I got energy and I'm ready to go. <laughs> right on, Brother Gus, right on. So we have someone who says, it's Evie, it looks like. I want to thank you for your time today. I have to say this is most refreshing history, the most refreshing history I've heard. And I cannot wait until it becomes a part of regular education the regular educational system. It says regular educational curriculum, I'm sorry. I would love to know how this movement feels different from the work you have done, or if it doesn't, and how we as allies can best show up for you. This is Evie. All right, in the days of the, the 60s and um, during the movement, you might have demonstrations for two or three days. Y'all have been demonstrating now for something like 19 days. And it's taking place all across the world. Um, I'm also amazed at all the different ethnicities that are participating. Latinos, a lot of white folks, etc. Everybody is beginning to recognize that this is not the America that was supposed to be, as Martin Luther King used to say. All of us here are immigrants, except for the Native Americans. And you have to think and recognize how this country is founded, how what I call the dregs of British society were escaping the monarchy of Britain and came over here to find another country, supposedly a democracy. But in that democracy, they created the first apartheid situation in the world, put the Native Americans on reservations. They had to have slave labor because Britain had said, for us to enhance our economy, we need cotton and things like that. The treatment of police and whatever right now is a continuation of the slavery from 1619. As far as they're concerned, we black people are still nothing but second degree, second uh, degree citizens, et cetera, and are not to be treated with any respect. I've said to people throughout the South where I do some work is we should rewrite the constitution. And first we should write a freedom charter like South Africa did after they came to freedom. Because our constitution, who a lot of people keep pointing to, is worthless. It's a whole lot of amendments that had to be amended because it was founded by wealthy white men who were property owners, whatever, and it was suited them. Remember, the beginning of the constitution was talking about we blacks are three fifths human beings. And women couldn't vote. Every amendment is an amendment to try to upgrade or correct something, but you can't correct you know, a soil piece of cloth that's buried in oil, everything, uh, turds, shit, whatever else. So we've got to take that depth of thinking. And you young people are very gifted now in technology and all this stuff. We got to encompass all that because as Malcolm said, we got to raise the quality of life. That means education. That means economics. That means We've got to have great respect for our women and for our children. We want to see the day of life and we got to understand environmental needs, whatever else. So it's a, it goes on and on. So whatever else, you all call the shot, we'll be there to help you in any way we want. Right on, Brother Gus. Like Malcolm said, improve the quality of life. So sure. John Van Horn Hickerson, is there anything you think Malcolm would advise or expect from white people in today's movement happening in the recent protests aside from what we know to do, listen, read, and try to put knowledge to action? That's a good question. Let me show you something about Malcolm. Can you hear me? 
Go ahead. Um, we used to go into restaurants or any place where there's a gathering of people. Um, all the white waitresses and people within these restaurants used to run to whatever at Malcolm's table. Because Malcolm would always include white people in the discussion. But he would explain to him first, he said, look, just because I'm a black nationalist does not mean I'm anti-white. He said, but I want to train my people first to have the common capacity to sit at an equal table with you to create an equal agenda. Because we've got some learning and y'all got some cleaning up to do. And that was, and, and I tell you, and, and, and Malcolm, although he died broke, he was one of the best tippers. So white folks used to love to come because he included them in the conversation. Waitresses could be there, they could ask a question or whatever else. Malcolm responded to everybody. That's the role I want to play. I want us to be at an equal place with white people. Because, you know, one of the reasons is Danny Glover is a good friend of mine. We do a lot of things together. That white people have been victims, didn't understand, but because of white supremacy, no matter how poor some of them were, they thought they just had to keep the distance from black people and keep a foot on their neck. But Malcolm said, look, a whole lot of white people work in coal mines and stuff. They're victims of black lung disease. They don't have health care and stuff, just like this pandemic virus it's shown us now that we don't have health care and other kinds of things. We are common victims of certain situations that is a result of, of, of the billionaires and people like that who want to perpetuate the status quo so that they can stay in charge at the expense of all others. And that's why so many people are marching today. So we want to have an understanding of each other as we want people to know our problems, what we want to help in cleaning it up education-wise or whatever. We want to know, likewise, the white folks' problem, the Latinos' problem, certainly our brothers, the Native Americans, et cetera, and whatever else. This is a common problem we got to do of creating the America in the world society that we hope for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gus. We got a couple more questions, and then we'll be wrapping up. So somebody says, and this is Jim Anderson, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us, Gus. In what ways were you changed by the relationship you had with Malcolm? <laughs> That's interesting. I have, a, I, have a, I have a very heavy voice, as you can hear. I remember we were sitting around having a meeting one day with the first black elected official in Rochester, a couple of black cops and some other people. And, you know, one of the things in the day of the civil rights movement, if a black person played the role of a Tom, we call him out in a minute. And we we're having a discussion on some public policy or something. And I said, no, it can't be done like this. It's got to be done. Like this. And Malcolm said, to me, go, go down, Brother Gus. Let him talk on. They, they go hang themselves. Say, you're a very intelligent brother. I want you to process what they're saying on the left side of your brain now. Now the right side, think about next steps that we're going to have to do to make this thing correct. He said, so Malcolm always told me to have absolute focus in taking whatever and be strategizing as you are participating, what to do. And although Malcolm made his point so cryptically when he was talking, whatever else, here he was saying, take it easy, young blood, you know, this and that. The other thing Malcolm used to always say, always know what time it is. We had a couple of major brothers that wouldn't show up on time for certain meetings. Malcolm said, y'all will buy some watches and keep them set to the right time. You can't go with me because I ain't going nowhere late. Just, you know, little basic things like that. That's crucial information. Go buy yourself some watches. I need to go buy me one. <laughs> so we got a question that's live here. It's not in chat. And the question is, the OAAU was moving towards bringing claims to the United Nations. Is this call still relevant? And how has it changed from Malcolm's movement? I think it's very relevant. If you've stated, stated attention to the media, the United Nations Committee on Racism is active again, and it's talking about some things that need to be looked at. I served on two committees at the United Nations Committee on the question of Palestine and the Committee Against Apartheid. Uh, Berkeley, which I was the mayor of, 
was the first city to divest in South Africa, in the U.S. And of course, uh, through Edward, Edward Said, I became very knowledgeable. As a matter of fact, after the first intifada, I was taken into Palestine and got locked down in Gaza and some of the things I saw. So definitely, and if that, I, I, I really appreciate this question and, and we should be gathering questions and thoughts about things that we should be put to the United Nations. And I do have still some context. So I would gladly see that we got these on the floor of the United Nations or wherever else. And I, I'd like this to stay in touch with the brother asking that question. Excellent. Now, there's another question here, which is, Malcolm knew his life was in danger. What do you think sustained him in the face of this danger? You know, Malcolm was a man like unlike any I have ever known. You know, he did like 15 years in prison and he read everything he could get his hands on. When he decided who he was gonna be for a better world, he totally cleaned up and made a commitment to it. But I think make a comparison. Martin said, I've gone to the mountaintop before he got killed. What history also does is show Malcolm and Martin had become very close friends, but they had wanted to know it. A couple of years ago, we were put together information and raising money to do a movie uh, at, on the death of Malcolm X and some other things. The brother who had been researching for seven eight years used to be a Muslim and he had brought it to my attention through a black newspaper that I called it Danny Glover, who be, agreed to be the executive producer. But the sad reality as we got down the line, this brother, who was a former Muslim, was a loner. He just won. He never kept everybody included. Danny wanted to be included all the time and whatever. So it's not gonna happen. But what Danny and I have talked about, maybe if we can put together enough people with enough information and we could raise some money, I could help make a movie happen because it wasn't just about finding out about the assassination, the depth of who Malcolm was and where he was taking us and where we hope to be. All that is so necessary and now more so than ever. Again, thank you, Gus. We got one more question. It's kind of two part. And I know th these two questions kind of go together. I see two people have asked the question, Pearl Boyd and Susan King, but these questions kind of go together. So one part of the question is, can you recommend some real history or some books that people can go look at after this so that they can get more knowledge? And then also it's another question about allies. As non-Black allies, what's the most important ways we can contribute to unity and humanity? I think it's got to be through engagement, as Malcolm told us. It's got to be a common agenda. And by a common agenda, I mean whatever are the topics of that agenda, they got to be thoroughly exhausted. One of the things that we found out often through white supremacy is that what we wanted to talk about wasn't worth talking about because those who weren't intelligent enough, those days are gone. As we see what's happening, you know, throughout the street, et cetera, whatever else. Um, I think the other thing is, is that the books, uh, I have to get to Danny and get, get, get a list. And, and what happened, I, I'm going to give my uh, email and my phone number, and people should be able to contact Leo, because I will see that he gets this too. But I want people to understand, don't just bombard Leo. He's a man and a staff of himself. And, and, and we've got to raise resources to keep the Malcolm X Institute going and other things too. It's going to take resources to do these kinds of things. And let us all understand that. Anyway, my email is one word. Gus Newport, G-U-S-N-E-W-P-O-R-T at gmail.com. My cell phone is 415-828-0253. That's 415-828-0253. And let's always be objective and think collectively. Let's hear one another as we go forward. Let's build the movement that this world has never seen. Thank you. Again, thank you very much, Gus. Thank you, thank you. For those who are watching this and those who have endured 
through this conversation and benefited from this conversation, please make sure that you tune in to the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation and also let us know where you're from. Please leave in the chat where you're from and what brought you here. If you want to support the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation, we offer this free to the community, but it didn't, it wasn't free for us to put this on. There's a lot of resources that we had to use to make this happen. So please go to the Malcolm X website and hit the donate button, malcolmxfoundation.org slash donate. You can go there and make a contribution so that we can continue to provide programs like this. Without your support, we're not able to do these things. We are truly a grassroots organization. All week I've heard people who have visited our site say, I love being here because there's a real grassroots feel here. And that's the truth. We connect with real leaders who do real work and who have spent a lot of time doing this. And people like Gus are one of those immeasurable people that we just cannot afford to ignore. We have to hear these types of voices. So if you can, please donate to the Malcolm S. Memorial Foundation website. I see we have the slide up. The link is right there on the slide. And stay tuned to the Malcolm X Foundation website because we have new things coming. We have more lectures going to take place. So also look for the newsletter link. It's in the chat and you can get updated on the events that we have going on here. So I am Leo, again, the board president of the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation, being assisted by the vice president, Joanna LaFleur. We have a number of other board members and constituents that support the Malcolm X Memorial Foundation here in Omaha, Nebraska, the birthplace of Malcolm X. And again, we won't waver. We will be who we are and we will move this movement forward with all of your contributions and all of your assistance, all of your volunteerism and all of your help. Gus, a true revolutionary. Thank you very much, Gus. Thank you to Janet, who really handled the tech for all of this thing down in Houston. We appreciate you much. Tune in next time. Thank you, brother. Peace, Gus. All right.